Um, so the next session is really focused on the modeling that's happened through the Kimberley um, Marine Research Program. And uh, in discussions with quite a few of the modelers, um, we thought it'd be really good to pull them all together, but have a session at the start with which both Matt Hipsy and Fabio Baschetti are going to provide, which is just an understanding of why model. What is, it, what is it about modeling that we need and how is the whole modeling program and everything that's done in modeling in the Kimberley going to help advance our knowledge for the Kimberley but also be used as management tools going forward. So I'll allow Matt. To, oh, just one other thing we just mentioned, we thought we mentioned at the start of the setting. Um, there was an email sent out for those of you that, um, for project leaders particularly, but we're having a session, a workshop tomorrow morning um, at, at, at uh, IMROC at UWA to talk about pulling together a publication from all of the research projects that have happened through the Wombsy program. So it's a bit of a discussion. The, um, some of the models talked about um, how they might pull together a publication. Then we've expanded that more broadly so that anyone that's interested in maybe pulling together a publication, we're not exactly sure what that would physically look like at this stage. There's a couple of different options like the Coral Reef book, the, uh, sorry, Scott Reef book, the Impacts book, that kind of thing. But if you're interested in discussing that, we're meeting at the Woodside Lounge uh, in the Imrock building, which is on level first floor on the Imrock building, apparently the best coffee in the building. So if you come along, you'll at least get a coffee um, from 9 till 11.30. So if you're interested in coming along, if you're around the UW area, please feel free to come and join us there. But otherwise, I'll start the session with Matt and Fabio, if you're going to. Great. Thanks, Stuart. Um, yeah, so um, I've got the unfortunate task of trying to convince you about modelling and um, of course, you've got all your rotten tomatoes ready. So all the modelers are over here. If you want to start uh, throwing some rotten tomatoes, then aim over this corner. Modeling, of course, is very important. We want to, uh, we, we've got a, a short session at the beginning to try and give you a little bit of a holistic overview of some of the modeling approach and our diversity modeling. And the reason we wanted to do this is because there's, there's lots of bits of modeling throughout different projects and they cover a lot of different scales and have a lot of different scopes. And so um, it can easily get confusing about uh, what model is, is suited for what purpose. And particularly when we're starting to think about how that rolls into management, we do start to, to sort of need some clarity on, on how this all fits together. <coughs> So I, I just quickly show you this slide. I love this picture. It's from The Economist, actually. It was about um, uh, you know, how in the data generation do we make sense of all this information coming at us. And of course, that is the motivation of modeling. And it, although people will argue the Kimberley is data sparse area, we still are saturated in data. And the role of the model is to help us pull that together. And that could be from very long-term predictions. It could be pulling in together monitoring data, it could be assessing anecdotal things. We want to pull it all together in a way that makes some sort of, some, some beautiful picture at the end where we understand uh, how the system is working. Of course, uh, I know many of you in the room are familiar with models and there's probably many of you that are, are less familiar with models. So I'll just give this really quick overview. Um, about the, the sort of different viewpoints you can have in being uh, a modeler and, and developing a model. And it can range from uh, uh, simply pulling our ideas together and up the top there, vehicle to support synthesis. And a lot of the work that has been done and you'll hear about this afternoon is really falling into that category. It's also helping us to reconcile theory with observation. So quite often a, a, an incorrect model is actually can be pretty useful as well because it means our best theory of what's happening uh, is maybe not, not uh, uh, correct. Uh, probably a lot of the modeling you're gonna hear about this afternoon is also about improving system understanding. We can use models to, to glue together patchy data, perform things like system budgets, assess how sensitive the system is to certain assumptions, parameters, or, or other assumptions. And then lastly, and this is where we tend to think of models, it's about assessing management scenarios. Uh, these could be uh, looking at future risks, climate risks, for example, coral bleaching, land use change, other changes like sea level rise. Could be looking at the sensitivity of policy options. Uh, Fabio in particular is going to talk to you a fair bit about that in his talk. Or just things like assessing management interventions. Ultimately, we could also start to consider things like real-time prediction and so on, but that's not really within the scope of the KMRP. So really there's a, a bit of a continuum going from the uh, top 
to the bottom of really using models to support knowledge discovery and helping us understand what's going on. And then at the bottom, it's more about uh, how can we manage the system optimally. So within the KMRP, there's a bunch of modeling. You're gonna hear about specifics in the, in the projects, but I wanna give you an overview. Firstly, there's catchment hydrology models done in, um, in the uh, land ocean project, how much water and nutrients and sediment are flowing towards the marine environment. There's a whole bunch of oceanographic models. They're physical oceanography models, uh, looking at things like currents, temperature, salinity, uh, water origin and fate, and, and things like flushing times. And then there's also biological oceanography models, looking at nutrient cycling, primary productivity, and so on. And then on top of all that, there's ecosystem models and, so, and linking with socioeconomic dynamics. Uh, particularly Fabio is going to talk to you about that this afternoon. And here we're looking at how, do the, how does mass transfer up through the food web? How sensitive is this to um, pressures and, and climate change? And then how can management policy options help manipulate that system? So here's a bit of a, a, a complex diagram showing you all the model packages that are being used. And the reason that we, we compiled this is to really get across the message that we're, we're spanning a whole bunch of scales and a whole uh, range of sort of complexity. So on the bottom here, we've got uh, the scale going from uh, 100 meters up to global scale. And maybe you can't see the, the heading there, but the, it says uh, short, uh, coastal shelf global on the bottom. And then on this side is terrestrial models. And we have some models that are right down here, less than 100 meters resolution. And then we also have modeling, which is plugging into global oceanographic, global uh, prediction systems. And then on this scale, we're looking at hydrology of the catchment up to hydrodynamics, biogeochemistry, things like nutrient cycling, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and then moving even above that into the, into the food web structure, and then potentially also the interaction of, of uh, policy and land use change with uh, ecology. And so you can see that they all overlap. They all have different acronyms. I won't bother you with all the acronyms right at the moment, but you'll, you'll see this, uh, these acronyms coming back as you hear the talks this afternoon. And you can see that they're sort of overlapping. So some projects are using two types of models. And there's reasons for that. And that's because we need to consider how do we change scale, for example, and how do we scale up uh, the food lab, for example. In this picture at the top here, you can see the domains that are being covered. So these, this black line is like a bay scale model. And this is for Collier Bay, which you'll hear about. There's also another little one here, put, which isn't part of KMRP, but this is a model of Gayan from, from his uh, PhD thesis in Roebuck Bay. There's this big uh, red box here, which is the shelf scale model. Uh, then there's this uh, sort of green shaded area, which is the ecological model that Fabio is gonna talk to you about. So you can see they're covering a wide range of scale and, and scope. So here's a picture of the, the catchment model predicting flows coming into the coast. And of course, it's obvious that's useful for us to understand uh, the, the terrestrial drivers of marine quality. Uh, there's coastal hydrodynamics models. So here's a, a picture of the ROMS domain uh, being used that um, uh, uh, Greg is gonna talk to you about uh, next. There's then moving up into biogeochemistry. Again, another coastal embayment model, very high resolution uh, in, the, in the coastal margin and simulating nutrient cycling and the, the foundations of the food web. We then step up in scale, and this is a, a model developed by Ming and his colleagues and also used by uh, Jim Greenwood in, in the biogeochemistry project. So now looking at this whole region and going from the, 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 the shallow water right off the shelf into deep water. Uh, Ming's model then looking at uh, the, using uh, uh, global predictions to drive how, how a regional drive is shifting uh, what's happening in the Kimberley region. So he's gonna talk to you about a model uh, uh, called OFAM, the, the Australian product, which is part of a, a, a global scale model. And then finally, on top of that, also at that sort of regional scale, 
uh, we have Fabio's project, which is going to talk to you about pathways uh, of mass and energy transfer through uh, the, the more complex marine food web. This is at a slightly different scale than, than the very fine scale hydrodynamic models, uh, but they're giving you a, a, an ability to understand how changes at the bottom of the food web may propagate up through the system, how climate changes may propagate up through the system, and how top-down changes, for example, fishing, may also propagate down through the system. Okay, so there's a, a wide variety. So where are we at, I guess, in the program as a whole, and looking at a little bit of a, a, a reflective slide, I guess, after a few years of these projects going on, really, when we started these projects, we had nothing. There was very limited prediction in the Kimberley region, maybe some, some uh, material from global scale predictions. So a lot of these projects, we've had to start from scratch. We've had to start with just compiling basic data. And so a lot of work in all of the projects are really at this level here. Conceptualizing our models, the scale, how do we set them up? Verifying, making sure, you know, as we say in the modeling fraternity, they pass the, the laugh test, making sure they're not predict, predicting something silly. Then we start getting into validation, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then finally, you start getting into application. How do we use this meaningfully to help day-to-day -day management or, or marine management plans or policy, for example? So some of us are probably here, some of us are probably here, and really this is an ongoing process. And we're finishing KMRP now, but hopefully the models will provide a legacy that can continue to be used and, and answer more specific questions going forward. So of course, um, uh, there's, there's people in the room that are skeptical of models, as, as are the modelers. I mean, that's, that's uh, the purpose of, of models is we have to sort of really critically assess um, that they're fit for purpose and, and they are usable. And how do we do that in an environment like the Kimberley where we have maybe data scarcity issues? So the, a nice quote here, I won't read it out, but basically highlighting this sort of uh, this dichotomy between models and, and observations. And, and to be honest, it's sort of true. I think modelers find it hard to convince non-modelers that the model is suitable and, and good for testing scenarios, uh, whereas People who collect data are, are, um, are, are sort of, uh, we, we treat that as the truth. I also like to use this picture, which is sort of the, the promise and where maybe some of the modeling goes bad, um, is we, we, you know, when we write our proposals, we, we uh, you know, give you this promise of a wonderful solution to everything, and uh, it's going to integrate everything, it's going to be great, and then you know, we get, we get through our projects and we, we start getting a little bit obsessed with one or two little things and, and maybe don't deliver the full picture. Um, but jokes aside, um, the challenge we do have in the Kimberley is validation. And so the talks you're going to hear about have been, uh, I guess, a really nice example from my, my point of view around how people have come up with solutions to this problem of validation across the spectrum of models to, to convince end users that they may be fit for purpose and, and have a role going forward for management. So the, the traditional way, and, and sorry, it's a bit technical, but the traditional way we would do it is we would have measurements like this, and then we model, and then we compare the difference between the measurements and, and the model, and that's our error, and we can get a correlation coefficient and so on, and that's, that's pretty standard. And we do that here, for example, in the Swan River, we have 10 years of this, these little red dots or, or 20 years of these little red dots. And so we can really test our models. In the Kimberley, we, we maybe have one dot or two dots or something like that. And so this sort of approach to validating and convincing people models are fit for purpose is less suitable. We have to be more creative. So data scarcity issues, no long-term monitoring, but also the spatial extent. There's a whole bunch of different regions we're covering coast to shelf terrestrial systems and so on. Another little bit of an aside, just to also put you in context for how things change as we move up from physics to biogeochemistry to ecology to social models. As we sort of rise up through, through that, we actually see our, our level of predictability going down. And this is nothing to do with the Kimberley. This is a, a synthesis, a meta-analysis of all aquatic models that were published up to 2004. Uh, so there's a few hundred, a couple of hundred in there. And basically, people can always get temperature pretty good 
correlation coefficient of almost one. But as you go down to, to nutrients, oxygen, and then eventually up into phytoplankton bacteria, the use of a correlation coefficient becomes less useful. The amount of error starts going up. And so we have to bear that in mind when we're, we're, we're trying to convince you about the suitability of models. So this is nothing new and, and the modelers are aware of this, but it's important that also the users are aware of this. As we move up through that chain, we, we go from high resolution models, which are very accurate at a particular point, we can test them, we trust them, um, but they become less usable for planning and management scales. Whereas on the other, the other side, we have less accuracy at this, um, at this scale down at the, looking at the ecology and society, but this is much more relevant to our decision-making, things about fishing policy or marine park policy and so on. So how do we reconcile this? And you'll see examples of this through the, the subsequent talks, but there's, there's sort of a general approach that we have to, to convincing you our models are fit for purpose. And this is by no means a, a sort of uh, exhaustive, but it, it's, the way, it's the way we think about trying to go through the model process. So for example, we have to first understand that at the first level that our model, our conceptualization is right. And, and all of the projects I think have done that pretty well. Then we have to go through and assess the state of the model. So that is, are we accurately capturing temperature or the number of fish or the number of plankton or whatever it is. Then we can look at things like, are we getting the pathways right? Not the actual things that we're simulating, but are we getting the pathways right? Are we getting the amount of productivity right? And then finally, we look at the system as a, at a sort of a macro scale. And we look at things like what we call emergent properties. How do, how, is the system, is the model accurately capturing these sort of emergent dynamics that we would expect to see in a complex system? And so a few examples that you'll see range from looking at things like moorings and transect data, which are really a level one state validation, then looking at processes, things like rates of productivity, where we've got measurements, things like recycling of nutrients. And they, they're, they're looked at closely uh, when formulating and testing the models. And then finally, the emergence of patterns. Things you'll see, for example, comparing uh, predictions with patterns in, from a satellite, for example. That's an emergent property. Uh, things like food web transfer efficiency. So Fabio, for example, will talk to you about how uh, even though he has a very complex food web, he knows that the, the pathways and nutrients going through them fit with our empirical theory. So it doesn't mean they're perfect, but it does give us uh, some trust that even though we can't convince you with an R squared that they're 100% accurate, we have certainly done the due diligence that uh, they are fit for purpose in, in looking at those other metrics. So the next question is, you know, how do we use the, that diversity of models across scales and, and scopes to, to help inform management. And, and really this is, a, a, I guess, a rhetorical slide for you um, as you're listening to this afternoon's talks to be thinking about uh, where there's opportunities here to, to use the models as a legacy from the research. So although the projects you're gonna hear, they all have a, a large amount of data collection, or most of them have a lot of, large amount of data collection, and that's an important legacy of the projects but the models are also an important legacy where the knowledge can be used going forward. And there's a whole bunch of scales, whether it's looking at you know, local scale issues, uh, bay scale issues, shelf scale, right up to regional scale. And I've just put a few things here that, that we've been talking about that are relevant. For example, you know, what if you change the sanctuary zone extent? Uh, what, what impact is climate change gonna have? Uh, you know, what, what if, what around, what if you change tourism policies, how might that propagate through the system? So the individual uh, projects will talk about some of those uh, uh, options to you in a bit more detail, but I just want to leave you with that uh, to, to help, help you think about, well, you're hearing about the science, but how can we use the science going forward uh, as a legacy to help inform uh, not only day-to-day decision-making, but future management plans and so on. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll leave you there. And um, yeah, I didn't get any tomatoes, so that's very good.